Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is artist Kenny Scharf and author John Morgan Wilson. Kenny Scharf was born in LA, grew up in the San Fernando Valley, then moved to Beverly Hills, where he attended Beverly Hills High. After college in Santa Barbara, Kenny moved to New York. What took you to the frenzy of Manhattan from this kind of really serene California life that you had? Well, I was in a art history class in Santa Barbara, and we came to the section on pop art, and Andy Warhol and the factory, and I was pretty much packing my bags and... During, during school? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I, I gotta leave here, and I know that it's not the 60s anymore, it was the 70s, but I knew that there must be something like that going on there. And uh, at the time in the 70s, the art world in California, it wasn't very exciting. And you know, New York was the place to be. So I thought, I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to meet Andy Warhol. And did, I'm you, wait, did you really have these things in your mind? Oh, yeah. Because Edie was, Edie's family was from Santa Barbara. Right. Did you know I never knew that? her, but I, of course, I knew about her, and I read you know, her book, and I've seen her in the, in the films right. and stuff. But, but was that before you went? Yes, it probably was. Around, around the, the time, same time yeah. yeah. So when you got to New York, did your dream come true? Well, did you meet Andy Warhol? I did. It wasn't right away. <laughs> and in retrospect, it, it was pretty quick. But at the time, it seemed like an internal wait to get to meet him. Was that the, the one big goal? Because here you had all these pop artists. You had Lichtenstein and Rosenquist and Rauschenberg right. and Jasper Johns and... They're all fantastic. On and on. All inspirational uh, artists. But there was something about the factory, the scene that enticed me. Um, it just was so exciting that I wanted to... And there I was. I was already there, Kenny. You were. <laughs> I was already there, <laughs> ahead of the Santa Barbara art student who came in. How did you happen to then hook up with Keith Haring? Was it after you met Andy? No, it was before. Keith and I, uh, I, I had moved to New York, and I was going to School of Visual Arts. Uh, uh, why did you go to? Uh, that was the only one that would accept me. But I mean, were you still going to go to school? Was that your idea when well, you I went was, to New York? Well, I was going to UCSB for two years. Oh, I see. And when I was living in Santa Barbara, and I told my parents I'm moving to New York, and they said, I said I'm going to go to art school. OK, well, you have to apply to all these different art schools, and oh. here in LA as well. So you went with a purpose, a yeah. art purpose. Yeah, and I was happy I didn't get accepted to any of the art schools here. <laughs> right. And uh, the one that would accept me was that school. And I met Keith uh, ah. probably my first week he was attending the school. He was going to school, too. Mm -hmm. And he had come from Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Did, was he kind of uh, quiet like he was then, or was he more outgoing? Well, as soon as I met him, uh, we kind of made a connection. and. Uh, I felt like I found someone who has the has a crazy drive uh, similar to mine, oh. and uh, he was doing amazing things back then, and uh, we just hit it off right away. So you ended up at a time when you were painting with Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf, um, um, some of the other taggers. Um, I lots can't of, remember. Lots of graffiti artists. A lot of graffiti artists. And you were actually said to be a graffiti artist. I was called a graffiti artist because I did a lot of art in the street with spray can. Oh, you did do that? I did. And I actually went down in the subways a couple times. But I never considered myself a graffiti artist. You know, I, I, I'm from LA, <laughs> and I went to Beverly Hills High School. And there I was, you know, in the trains with all these 
these homeboys from the South Bronx. So I never really wanted to say that I was that, but I did partake in the whole time. And my attitude towards making the art in the street was very different. I wasn't a tagger. I didn't have one tag that I just like they had a repeated. Right. I did something different each time. It, I thought of it more as art in the street than a actual graffiti. So what was the difference between your art and their art then? Well, as I was saying, they did something called a tag, which was everyone had a signature, right. signature basically, and you try to get it out as many times as oh, possible. Just get your signature out. Yeah, whatever that style was that you did. Right. And I wasn't about making one signature. I was uh, about I see, I see. just making a million different things. But I remember one of the times uh, at Studio 54 I went in and all the hallways were filled with your art, the bathrooms. I see, was it, you mean was the Palladium. 50, the Palladium. Yeah. Oh, it was already past 54. It was the Palladium. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Steve Bell and Ian Schrager. <laughs> right. But it was another club, yeah. It was another club. But yeah. it was all over. And it was framed, right? There were pieces framed. You had also painted on the walls. I did uh, a installation there, and actually it was in the basement. I did the telephone booths I remember that. and the hallways. Yeah. And it was kind of like a lounge. And then there were some paintings uh, as well. It was the Palladium. Yeah. I, can't, I couldn't remember 85, that. 1985. I see. But how did they happen to choose you, or did you go to them? Well, um, I, I guess I was uh, a rising art star in New York at the time, and uh, art had just become, well, as I remember, uh, Steve Rubell said, art stars are the rock stars of today. <laughs> right. So they're opening a big nightclub, um. and they kind of decided to get a few different artists. There was me, Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, and Francesco Clemente that oh, were all asked to do something for the club. I see. So everyone went then as they became their own stars, not a group of stars anymore. They're, they all went their own way. Your work turned out to be like what we have on the set today. Well, this is a, a small little piece of But But how would example. you, it's, it's been described as cartoon art. We know it's not that simple. We know that there's a lot of thought and, and you're, for want of a better word, philosophical about what you put on that canvas. So why don't sometimes you there is, sometimes there's not. Oh, I mean, uh, really? I have uh, many different uh, ways of uh, making a painting or a piece of art. Sometimes I just want to escape and and have fun with color and forms and shape and not think about uh, issues. And sometimes I'll do something that's very uh, based on a certain, maybe a political point of view. Right. Uh, very dogmatic. But you use the same style. No, I don't actually. Oh, okay, then tell us. Well, I have, I've gone through many different styles. Uh, can I see it in here? Yeah, you might be able to uh, show you. I can maybe find it for you. So, um, the style that I guess I'm known do, for. This is, let's start with something like this that's framed. It looks framed. Okay, well, there's yeah. a different style right there. <clears throat> this is a series of paintings I did called the Wildlife uh, series. Wait, the other side. The other side. This one. Yeah. This one, yeah. Based on uh, that scenes one, right. from uh, national, national, natural history. Ah. And they're more realistic, uh, although there's a lot of fantasy still in there. Uh, I actually have a few of this paintings from this series in showing right now at Gagosian Gallery. And then on this side? This is more, this is a more, this is a recent painting, but it's more of the style that people, I guess, kind of associate with me, uh -huh. which is uh, what I named back in 1981 or something, I called it pop surrealism, which is taking uh, pop imagery like cartoons uh, and fusing them with, well, actually that one's kind of a more abstract. I mean, this one. This one would be, I guess, more in the pop surrealism style, although you got abstract art were you painting? Too. Were you painting like this when you were in New York? Because you're living here now. You're yeah. living in Los Angeles now. Uh, well, actually, that painting was done in Florida. But um, see, I, I kind of like to bounce around in different styles. I've kind of created uh, a few different styles and ways of working, and I might 
uh, I don't do one painting in one style and then bounce to the next the next day, but I'll go through a f period of a few months to a year in a certain like genre of that I created. And then I'll think, oh, well, I want to go back and explore another mm. way of working. So it really doesn't have to do with your age and growth. That was one of the questions I was going to ask you as you get older and as you got away from that pop mm -hmm. culture type of thing, that did your work change? But it doesn't sound so much like... I'm, I'm constantly uh, evolving Re yeah. and revolving and going back and exploring and refining. And uh, it's, it's a constant uh, evolution. You mentioned that you have it uh, that you show at Gagosian. I know you There's show at Gagosian right now, yeah. Gallery. He, who had he, Larry Gagosian has a gallery in New York and Los Angeles. Does he pick a certain kind of artist to show with him? Do you think? Well, I think uh, if you look at this artists that he shows, they're pretty varied. In they the, they seem to yeah, be pretty varied. I showed with Larry back in '84 here in LA, and then I haven't shown with him since uh, until now. Over the past 20 years that I've known you, maybe longer than that, you lived in upstate, you moved to New York, I right. and then you moved to upstate New York to a huge mansion, mm -hmm. then you moved to Brazil, mm -hmm. then you moved to Florida. Yeah, I'm kind of a And now gypsy. you're back in Los Angeles. Now I'm back to my And you my have roots. a family. I have two girls and a, and a wife and dogs and, and cats move and along, birds. And they move along with They you. have to come with me. They don't always <laughs> like to, but... They, they come with me. Yeah. And what happens when you're in each one of those places? Do your influences change? Uh, well, I think they do, or whether you want them to or not. I think uh, where you live obviously has an effect. In color, do you think, or light? In colors, in, in all the different ways. Um, but for the most part, I think most of my work comes from inside. Mm. So it doesn't really matter where I am. Uh, I might get inspired by a place or something I see, but most of it comes from from inside. I I love this sculpture. I'm gonna put it I'm gonna carry it here because I think it's me. <laughs> I have this <laughs> I have this um, collection of portraits. I know. And I, I don't know. think you have to go very far. I have to do your portrait. I'm doing portraits right now. Are actually. you? Yeah. That'd be great. But does this look like me? Actually yes, it just take those two eyes and put it right in the middle and <laughs> there you, you are. Can you do it? That's it. <laughs> um, have you done a lot of things like this? Um, this was for a uh, mannequin company called Pucci. I designed oh. mannequins and these were actually uh, what they uh, they call the minis and they hang jewelry on them. Oh, they're great. Oh, so they are? They would go into a store? Yeah, this is a commercial project. Uh, I've done windows from this project and I actually right now I'm, I designed and I'm fixing up uh, the children. I did a bunch of children mannequins. That's so great because when you first went to New York, Andy Warhol was doing windows. And Rauschenberg yes, there was is doing a long, windows. A long line of pop artists doing uh, so you can store windows. Whoop, but they you usually see. did them before. <laughs> That's what I mean. And I found myself doing them after. And it but I think it's probably more fun for you. They were doing it as a way right. of survival. Now well, I got to do it with my art. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't you know, so it was a better position. I yeah, think. yeah, that's great. And congratulations. And thanks, thanks for coming and being with us today. And don't go away. We'll be right back with John Morgan Wilson. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author John Morgan Wilson. John Wilson lives in West Hollywood, where his Benjamin Justice mystery novels take place. He's a graduate of San Diego State, where he was an award-winning columnist for the school's Daily Aztec. We have the Daily Trojan at SC. John, um, you've been teaching at UCLA in the writer's program. You teach both fiction and uh, nonfiction. How do you teach the difference? Because you write a lot of fiction. Well, actually, it's UCLA Extension Writers Program, and there is a difference between UCLA and UCLA Extension. Uh, UCLA Extension is open to the entire public, and uh, I taught uh, nonfiction for about 15 years because that's what I did. I started out as a journalist, yeah. did a lot of freelancing, wrote a book on magazine article writing back in '93. I'd love to see that. I don't think we ever know. I mean, 
I'm a journalist too, and I think you always are doubting yourself. Am I doing it the right way? Is there an easier way to do it? Well, it's a real nuts and bolts book, but it just went out of print, I think, after seven years. It was wow. in hardcover for seven years. Really? And in 95, 96, I had moved back at the end of the 80s, I moved into uh, television, fact based writing, documentaries, reality, news. And I've been doing that through the 90s, but in the middle of the 90s, I decided to write uh, mystery fiction and wrote my first one and, and got a contract with Double A to write three more. And I decided I would rather teach uh, fiction writing than nonfiction because that's really where my, my passion was developing. Well, you talk about fact based work that you do. Um, did it come from your, did your fiction writing come from your fact based work? I think that. Uh, a lot of the skills, uh, you can really ground yourself well in skills when you're a pretty seasoned print journalist. But what about storylines? Uh, well, I was a reporter. I started out as a police reporter many, many years ago. And in the documentary writing I've been doing, I'm doing a show now called Anatomy of Crime on Court TV. I deal with a lot of crime. And I've always had a fascination for crime, criminals, uh, and also uh, police work. And also a running theme in my mystery novels, kind of the abuse of power. And that's kind of a running theme from book to book to book. How would you get into, say, this mystery genre when we had all those Cold War, you know, dramas going on, and you kind of think like, well, this is going to be the end of, of any intrigue, and yet you've created all this Benjamin Justice intrigue. Well, you know, mystery writing and thrillers are two very different genres. Ah. Uh, thrillers are primarily driven by suspense. Mm -hmm. uh, the ticking clock and mysteries are literally about who done it, who committed the murder, and you don't find that out to the end of the book. Now, the intricacies, the more. intricacies, the detective work. Now, sometimes they they uh, become a hybrid. A lot of people mix the two genres now, but they are two distinct genres. That's interesting. And I write mysteries. I don't write thrillers. Although I just finished my first thriller, my agent gets it in a couple of weeks. But but can't uh, a detective work uh, piece be a mis um Suspenseful? Sure, and that's uh, when they do thriller? mix. That's when they do mix. But if you don't know who the murderer is till the very last scene or the last page, which is the classic mystery or who done it, that's a, a pure mystery. That's what the Benjamin Justice mystery series is. Well, Benjamin Justice lives in West Hollywood. It's a, t a very gay neighborhood. Well, it's a very mixed neighborhood. It's mixed, but we always think of it as a, a gay uh, neighborhood. And he turns out to be a gay detective? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I mean... He's not a detective. He's a, he's a former uh, investigative reporter. Uh -huh. He was a brilliant young investigative uh -huh. reporter for the LA Times uh -huh. who won a Pulitzer Prize and had to give it back because he fabricated the story and they found out. And this is his great burden. No one ever believes him. So he has to nail down every fact when he investigates a murder on his own, a tighter than anyone else, because he carries this great burden of no credibility. But we have the usual private eye or gumshoe or whatever you want to call him who is like Mr. Macho, Mr. Heterosexual. Is there a difference in his characterization? He's a pretty tough, reckless he guy. Is USA he? Today uh, recently compared him to Raymond Chandler's uh, character, Philip Marlowe. He said he's reckless like Marlowe. Uh, he's uh, down and out sometimes and fights back against, he's the underdog. Uh, but he may, you know, they, USA Today, they gave a great review for the latest, uh, latest book, The Limits of Justice. They said the difference is, though, he is gay. And of course, in this latest book, it's kind of a milestone. He's also HIV positive. He becomes the first HIV positive mystery series hero in the history of uh, publishing, to my knowledge. This is uh, The Limits of Justice, which is just out. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this when Benjamin Justice finds out about his health condition? When the book opens, uh, he has found out about it. He's been on a six-month uh, destructive drinking binge and his health is in serious decline and jeopardy. It was at the end of the third book, which was Justice at Risk, which came out last year and it was kind of a cliffhanger at the end. We didn't know if he was HIV positive or not. Oh, I see. So I have Justice at Risk right here in That's paperback. So right. I can take this on the airplane with me the next time I go out. Um, you, you've said that he has this disease and it's a fatal disease in many many case situations and you do have a series of these books are you putting a, a, a limit on this 
poor Benjamin Justice guy? Or? Not at all. You know, when I pitched it to Doubleday, uh, the, thing, the thing that's happened, of course, is the new medicines have come out. They came right. out in the mid-90s, and many, many lives were uh, uh, being prolonged. The quality of life was much greater, and many people were living 15, 20 years with HIV, and even longer. That's the case now. Right. Now, we've learned that these drugs, the so-called AIDS cocktail, is not a panacea or a cure. And I kind of decided to have Justice become HIV positive when that news was coming out because a lot of people were taking it as a panacea, uh -huh. saying it was a cure. Uh, my involvement with the gay community, with the AIDS community, I lost my lover in 87. Um, and even though I came out of the 80s uninfected by the virus, I worked the AIDS hotline, I was very involved with it and still am very involved with it. I, I, I wanted to take him in this new direction to engage me uh, with him as a writer again and to take, give him maybe another obstacle and challenge in life that would take the character and the stories in a new direction and maybe freshen it a little? Well, I was going to say, it will take it in a new direction, Can it, 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 but I guess with this new drug that you're talking about, can prolong his life too and you can oh, talk about Oh, he could be around that. for 15, 20 years oh, so and who knows what's going to happen in that time because uh, it, with this, you know, being HIV positive in the year 2000 is so much different than being HIV positive in 1990. Right. There are all these options, these treatments, people can get early detection, that's why it's so important to get tested. And, and do you feel this is kind of a mission in this book that you're, you're doing You know, I didn't well? want it to be. When I sat down to, to write the first uh, Justice Mystery, which was Simple Justice in 1990, it came out in 96, and won the Edgar Award for Best First Mystery. I was going to ask you about that. Go on, let's talk about well, that. Well, that, that, that was, that was a, an honor. I was very flattered to win that. And uh, when I sat down to write the book, I kind of envisioned this lighter, more commercial, more entertaining, page-turning kind of mystery. But from the first line, I found the voice of this character, and it was very dark, very hard-edged. He was a very troubled, complex character. And I think a lot of what I had brought with me from the 80s and what a lot of us had gone through losing so many friends to AIDS, I didn't expect that. That wasn't in the outline you I'd worked That out. wasn't you? It wasn't autobiographical? Uh, a lot of it turned out to be much more autobiographical than I expected and much, much darker. And so once it got going, it felt real to me. It felt good. We sold the book very quickly to Doubleday. They signed me to write three more. Was that the one you wrote so fast? Very fast, seven weeks. Because that is fast. For, I mean, I, I could never write a book, but I can write a column. So it, there's so, so many differences, I think. I mean, you can get a column out really fast because you have to do it, you're on deadline. But usually books take a, a much longer Well, I think about them a long time and I outline and research and think through the characters and work from a very, very well-developed outline before I start writing. And then when I start, I work uh, 10, 12, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, you'd and say partly that's out of necessity. I write for a living. So the longer I take, the uh, less money I make. And I if I see. took six months to write it on the advances I get, I'd be broken in debt. How do you write it, actually? I sit at the computer, you, and I make those write? fingers move, and I keep my behind in the chair, because that's the secret to being a professional writer. Don't leave the chair. That's, that, that's, keep you writing. Teach that? Oh, you yes. Teach that? In my UCLA extension classes, I'm teaching a mystery writing workshop, a two-day on October 7th and 14th uh, coming up. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, they'll hear that again and again. But you got the Lambda Award and you got the Edgar Award. Do you think those awards helped you in selling your book or I think involving yourself? Certainly the Edgar Award. It's, some people call it the Oscar of mystery, mystery writing. And I think it, it helps you reach a broader audience of especially hardcore mystery buffs. It really means something in the mystery world. And there is a real group, isn't there? Very much. It's one of the most gratifying things to me because when I wrote this mystery novel, honestly, I was not a mystery buff. I loved mysteries as a kid, but I came back to mystery writing after reading Walter Mosley's Devil in a Blue Dress in the oh, early no. 90s. And I loved the book so much, I started reading mysteries again and found out that mysteries had changed tremendously. They were much more diverse. They weren't just the old hard-boiled gumshoe with a dame at the end of the bar and a whiskey in one hand and a gun in the other. They, there were women primarily broke down the, the barriers, Marsha Muller in particularly and Sarah Paretsky. Uh, 
opened it up. And when women opened it up to female sleuths, mm. then gay sleuths were created, <laughs> and right. then rabbi sleuths were created. And, and, and it doesn't matter anymore what your sleuth is if you tell a compelling story and your character is interesting. And once I realized there was this diversity, I thought there might be a place in mystery writing for me. I wrote my first one, and then when I had this contract to write three more, I said, gee, I better find out what mystery writing's all about. And what I discovered was this wonderful world of mystery fans, people who are very uh, uh, selective, very demanding, but if they like your series character, they are very loyal. Then they keep following you from one book to the other. Yes. That's why it's to the publisher's advantage to sign you up for three, three and books And that's why they like to, to buy the series. And what's interesting, when The Limits of Justice came out this year, and it's done much better than any of their other books, and as it's, it's now gone into a second printing, and as it's sold better, the paperbacks have started selling because uh -huh. people discover the new one and they go back and rediscover the first uh -huh. ones, particularly Simple Justice, the first one, and then people start reading through the but, series. But then they know your name, they know the character, and they're more familiar with what's going on. Would they miss something? Like, like this one you said was a cliffhanger to the AIDS uh, mm -hmm. infection. If they went back and read it after they wrote Limits of Justice, would it still work for them? No, a lot of people love doing that, going back and, and, and find, discovering the character from his beginnings. Uh, each, uh, Benjamin Justice ages chronologically and goes through life crises and relationships uh, naturally from book to book to book. He gets older from book right. to book to book. But each book is also a standalone book. It so you does. can read The Limits of Justice and understand everything that's going on or you can go back and start over with Simple Justice and read through the all four Justice Mysteries. Well, we've got, we've got the line now, the line of reading we can do and how we can do it and I think we should start with the limits of justice and then go back and see Benjamin Justice and what he does. And we thank you so much for being with us, John Wilson, today. And I wish you could teach me to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could just sit down and get started. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you for being uh, with us today on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Thank you. Yeah, you look great.